I'm kind of a new guy as far as it comes to fine woodworking and woodworking in general. Um, quick background, I was born and raised in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. I went into the Marine Corps in 2001, got out in 2005, uh, bounced around for a little bit here and there. And then my younger brother started a construction company, residential construction, asked me if I'd join, I said, sure. Um, first year we did like 70 grand, four years later we're at, you know, we just hit a million. So things are going really well, but uh, me and my brother had some differences of opinion. So I bailed, I went- A million bucks will do that to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I bailed and I went in, uh, for a commercial construction company. And I was a super, it was a management company. So we were technically weren't supposed to be uh, physically working, but you know, they realized I was the, uh, a carpenter so they I was building and running jobs at the same time so it just it burnt me out. Um, I found this tool through uh, a, the therapist I was seeing at the time believed that creativity was a form of healing for PTSD so he, we talked of you know hours about what I liked and apparently I really like woodwork so I signed up for the North Penitude School in 2017. I graduated uh, from the cabinet and furniture making program in 2019 in the spring and I opened up a shop with two other classmates in the uh, spring of 2019, and I haven't had a day off since. So uh, I built everything from kitchens to, you know, hand carved staffs. It doesn't really matter. I don't have any like real particular. Um, but eventually, I would, I'm, I'm a third generation Japanese, well, half Japanese anyway. So the Gunner Gray Furniture Fusion is I want to fuse the Japanese heritage into the Western style that I learned. So some of the things you'll see in here that may be a little, you know, some of the Kimiko and some of the joinery that I practice is all, you know, Japanese, like Japanese chisels. I haven't, I have some kind of hand plans, but I haven't had time to uh, tune them up quite yet. Um, so with that being said, we'll get into the uh, demonstration. So everybody knows, you know, you call them butterfly splines, dovetail splines, whatever, bow ties. Um, but I found a way to make them Quickly, because you know when you make these things, if you're making them one at a time, not only does it take a long time, they're all different. So you have to, you know, write on a piece of wood which one goes where, you know, all these things. So instead, I designed that to make a log of them. So you do this um, on the table saw. You make them any different size, any different angle. But then once you get that piece of wood cut to that, you can just slice them off on a cross cut board. So you have, you know, there's probably 75 splines right there. And it makes everything easier. So, so you have to get the, the grain brush. Right? Yeah. So you can obviously you have to you know you don't want to use really narrow boards because you're doing it on a table saw because you know there's more potential for kickback. But um, you know if you get 10, 12 inches, something like that, where it can pass through both sides of the blade, it's relatively safe. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Dovetail logs. So once you figure out what kind of wood you want to use, if it's, you know, I, I think uh, black walnut's a great one because it goes good with everything. You know, in maple and cherry and whatever, it, the, the contrast of the dark really adds to everything. So once you figure out what you're going to, you know, the wood species you want to use, you figure out your grain orientation because obviously you have to cross cut these pieces out because if you rip them, your grain orientation is going to be wrong. The dovetail spine will fail. So if you're looking at it, you just cut, you just cross cut the sections out. And once you do that, you figure out what you want your angles to be. All right, so at our shop, we have a Tanowitz table saw. So it's a right tilting arbor, it tilts into the fence. I know not everybody has, you know, 19 or 20 Tanowitz in their basement. So what you can do is you can just take your, your, your fence off, flip it on the other side of the blade, so then that way the blade tilts into the fence. So once you do that, you set up your angle, you know, whatever you want to do. I like my bow ties to be uh, skinny. I think they look more elegant that way. Um, lay out your angles. You figure out, you know, whatever the height's going to be for the center. So it meets perfectly on both sides. Once your blade is angled, you move the fence and you just take off little bites at a time. You know, you're not taking off, the, you're not plowing off the whole because then you're going to end up with this funky wedge. It's going to get trapped in there, and there's a lot of pressure on the blade. So I take off a 16th at a time off each side, all four sides. So run it through once, flip it, run that side, flip the board over, run it, flip it, run it. And you just keep bumping the fence until you get to where you want to be as far as this, these little splines go. So uh, so since you're hogging off material with 
from the center. Mm -hmm. When you flip it over, you can still have a flap on both sides. So it's Correct. Gap. Yeah. So right. even, I mean, even if you look at it as it's already cut, you know, if you put, you know, you're still going to have contact on the top and bottom no matter what. So do you go, you leave a little flat? No, exactly. I go right. I, those are right off the side. I haven't touched those with uh, any kind of hand tools. I mean, do you stop cutting when you still have a little bit of flat to put up against the fence? No, no. Because once once you start moving that table, once it's going to duplicate the same on both sides. So you're going to have the same thing no matter mm -hmm. what, if there's a flat on there or not. You know. So you're doing both top and bottom on one side, and then flip it. Yeah. So then you, do you top and it, bottom like on this, the other side. Can I see one of those logs? Someone has one. <clears throat> well, technically, you're cross cutting, so you're going to want something with a little bit of higher heat. Uh, you could probably get away with a rip blade, but you're just going to have a really uh, rough finish on it. But yeah, so if you're pushing, like say that you're pushing through the saw, mm -hmm. you cut this, flip it, cut this, right. flip it. So every cut's going to be the same no matter what. As long as your blade is centered on this piece of wood, which is a very important step. It's yeah. just, it's going to cut the same. So you're working your way down. You yeah. Know, so you're just stepping in, you know, because if you took this whole cut, yeah. if this piece was whatever, an inch and a quarter, three quarter thick, you took that whole cut. I mean, that's a lot of work on the saw. But then when you flip it over and you cut or cut it again, now you have this wedge right. that could just go in. And that's, you know, everybody knows that's dangerous. I guess I was just thinking of a little bit of gap under the fence. You could get the corner in there, but yeah. you could have set. Uh, not a sacrificial fence. You have a fence. You have a, an auxiliary fence. Yes. Every exactly. every table saw we do, we put wood on there. Yeah. It just seems to make more sense because you can get it as tight as you want. You can screw stuff to it, clamp stuff to it, whatever you got to do. Uh, so once you get these cut, then obviously you go straight to cross cutting, which is <clears throat> pretty simple. I mean, they don't have to be perfect. I think three eighths is probably as deep as you want to go. Um, they're more for decoration, really, I guess. I mean, they will stop the wood from splitting, but if it really wants to split, the still tie's not going to stop. I, I always thought they went all the way through. No. I go three eighths, maybe a half inch. But, you know, you're going to want to fill that gap anyway, unless you want that look where it's an open crack. But mm -hmm. you're going to fill it with something anyway, chances are, epoxy or whatever. Uh, yeah, it just looks nice, really. Because most wood, when you get it fully dry, well, not fully dry, it's 10 to 13%. It's not really going to crack too much. Um, so yeah, and then from there, does anybody, the, the process I do to, uh, so to do the dovetail splines, to actually inlay them in the wood, you know, a lot of people will put down painter's tape and they'll mark everything and they'll cut the painter's tape out and they'll have little router jigs. I was thinking maybe, you know, if you have a laser engraver, you could laser out a template based on, you know, one of the logs and you could just route the whole thing out and clean up the corners, but I have yet to do that. So laying these out in the wood. So if you're looking in the video, I just hold, you can, you know, you could double stick tape it down if you really wanted to, which, you know, there's no harm in that, but it's just an extra step. And when you're going quick, the last thing you want to do is spend time peeling tape off. Um, so from here, I use a marking knife. I'll mark the top and bottom. I'll see that the, the knife is angled a bit. So you don't want to mark just straight over because then that's good. The chances of you overshooting <clears> is a lot higher. So you cut there, make a mark, then you do a pencil line. On one side, oh, it's just gonna show. <coughs> so you can see, you can kind of see the pencil line there, right? Yeah. So then, after you get the one side pencil line, you just move the spine over a little bit to cover that pencil line, and then you strike the other line on the other side. So now you're working with tighter, you know, it's a little bit tighter, so there's less room for error. And then from there, I just I take a plunge router or a hand router, trim router, spiral up, cut it, hog out the most, you know the bulk of it, and then pair in with a chisel until it's, you know, really snug in there. So there's no need to uh, go for the gusto on the first hit. I just work my way back to the line. But it's, it's a pretty simple process. Um, I think 
it's intimidating to cut those on a, on a table saw, especially when it's, you know, 10 horsepower tanner woods with a 16 inch blade on it. But um, <laughs> you get it done, but I mean, it's, it really is. It, you can make them out of anything. I mean, I made a, maybe five logs when I was in school and I just used the last of it a couple months ago. They're great to have. I mean, I put them underneath so you can't see them sometimes. It just, it's good for that extra bit of security. But I mean, that's pretty much it as far as those dovetail spines go. It's not an overly uh, complicated task. It's just having the balls to do it. <laughs> as I say, this is kind of scary. But are anybody have questions about it at all? Did, did you ever think to make like a jig to hold that? Other than, are you putting pushing that little block through by yeah. hand? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I have a fast forward video through here. Yeah. You're just taking off little bites at a time. So you get to where you want to be. I mean, I'm using a push stick. You could put some sort of feather board there, but it, it's not really going to be practical with the angles. Right. So, yeah. I just wondered if it would seep into a jig of some kind so that your handle wasn't just a push stick above that. Yeah. I mean, there was a 12 inch blade. We were thinking about all the different kinds of ways. I'm sure there can be improvements to the method. You know, if you could clamp it in with some sort of toggle clamp and have, you know, some sort of fence going against the table saw. But, but because you're working both sides, you, yeah, you're you're yeah both it's, it's kind of uh, difficult. You're, you're, yeah. you're doing so much flipping for right. just one. Yeah. One just, quick it conscious. changes every, changes every pass. Right. So every fixture you try to put right. in, yeah, but you make it's it constantly it, changing. Right? It, it's, this block is going to have about. 20 on it. So in terms of time, yeah. after he makes a couple of few of those, he's done for the next five years. Yeah. Well, that's the, you know, that's the beauty of it. This took probably, I think I made, yeah, you, don't have to worry you know, eight of them. Either. It was, you know, an hour worth of time, maybe. Yeah. It's kind of what I like. Yeah. I mean, I, there's nothing as specific, you know, they can be different. People like the fatter ones, the these, I think this one is actually made by my shop mate, but these ones, I like them really narrow. I think they look kind of cool. And when I put them in, I just kind of randomly scatter them about it. There's no like pattern or nothing. They're not all going in the same direction. I put one down on a crack and I mark it and go to the next one. I think it looks, it looks nice that way where it's not exactly perfect. Um, but yeah. Any other questions on that in school? Did they have to do any of those in school? Or what do you no, mean? I did this. Well, I, this is where I figured it out was in the school, but yeah. The school is not, they're very um, period furniture orientated. So yeah. like I came in and like, I don't know. <laughs> I, I've never, you know, I never heard of a mortise and tenant until I walked through that school. So really, you know, yeah, I was, I was the run of the mill carpenter, you know, framing, roofing, whatever. And when I first got out there, I was actually pretty intimidated. So when you glue them in, I'm assuming you glue them in a little proud. Yep. And then sand them, sand it down. Yep. So Just a little block plane. And then, you know, from there you can sand it down. A little bit of type on one is pretty much all I use unless I'm doing something outside. But uh, yeah. but I thought there's a few other things we can go over tonight. If you, no one has any other questions. Um, so, you know, I mean, pretty obvious to me, but just making sure that the purpose of it is just to keep the wood from splitting more. Right. Other than the feather structure. Right. How do you know when you put the latch? It's better to be safe than sorry. I mean, it could it could split on you. I mean, I I've only been doing this for a handful of years, so I, you know, I've like the oldest piece of furniture, the oldest thing I've made was a headboard, and I used the, uh, it was pine. It had a pith going through it, and I didn't know what I was doing, so I went on like the samurai carpenter on how to do dovetail splines and figured out how to do it. It hasn't split more, <laughs> so I guess they do kind of work. But, you know, they're telling me the park was going to fall. The park's still on. It's been like eight years since I've had the thing, but. <clears throat> yeah, all depends upon when it was cut if the bark is yeah. going to stay on or come off. I just sprayed it with shellac. Yeah. I don't even wait for a crack. I just put them in all the stores. <laughs> <laughs> just wherever you think they're going to be. Yeah. I mean, the crack, if, if there is a crack forming, it may split more. But especially if you have something like this where there's branches coming out and there's a pith, I mean, it's it's eventually going to crack. But if, as long, once everything is really sealed properly, the wood shouldn't, ex it will still move, but not to the point where it's going to split in half on it. Um, but yeah, they, they just look nice. And when you see them in a crack, you're like, ooh, that's, you know, forever. But yeah. 
yeah. just one thing um, is that since your inlay needs are stuff by hand, right? Right. Uh, it's not like you're using a, like a, an acrylic jig or something. Right. That right. Standard, right? So right. you're inlaying them by hand. They don't have to even be perfectly symmetrical. No, they no. don't. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, te technically, no, they don't. You're right. Yeah. yeah. And you that's what we would probably make something like that. It would say like a rabbit or You could. Or yeah. Yeah. If you could, yeah. Just have to strike a line down the center. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you probably could. But, you know, for me, the, the difference between me and a lot of the other students that were there was I was a carpenter <laughs> for 10 years. So for me, time is money. So I'm, I was always looking, and the instructors had to pull me back, you know. I've built, I don't know, maybe 40 or 50 things while I was there. But, you know, I'm just always looking to the next step. How can I do this faster? How can it be more efficient? So it has its pros and cons. You know, it, it made a lot of mistakes for myself. But I've, uh, I've learned to slow down a little bit these days. Um, yeah. Anything else on the dovetail locks? Yeah. What was the this is probably about 10. Yeah, I just I kind of just eyeball what I like and you know, I'll set it on a, on a bevel gauge and just adjust to where it's at, you know. Yeah, they they really, yeah. I mean, there's, I thought about doing flowers and dragonflies. I mean, you can really do anything. Just that if you have a scroll saw, I mean, it's kind of endless what you can really do as far as designs and how much you feel like chiseling out, you know. But, you know, you have to think the way that these work is, you know, the grain is going this way. So, if you know, if you, once you get into those funky designs, that's when you can start, you know, you can get the wrong grain. 